Welcome to Hulu. This is just really wonderful to speak with you. This is definitely a highlight for me. Um, I was wondering if we could go back. Here, are we going to put up the images? Or? Up here. Um, Control. Yes. Oh, there it is. Okay. I'm hoping that we could start and uh, go back to when you first initiated this series. I mean, you write compellingly in the, your essay in the catalog about how you were interested in the exchanges and relationships. And so if you could just take us back to that process of how you began this project. Well, I was a very young photographer when I started this project. Uh, I was probably 19 or 20 years old when I made this one, uh, which was this particular one is the photograph that I call the first, the first successful photograph that I made that allowed me to know that I could be the thing that I had decided that I wanted to do. Uh, but my, my reason for being in Harlem were twofold. Uh, one, particularly in relation to uh, making photographs, had to do with my experience of going to the Metropolitan Museum of Art when I was 16 years old to see the exhibition Harlem on my mind. And uh, I actually didn't go to see the exhibition because it was an exhibition of photographs. Uh, I went because there was a lot of controversy uh, that was uh, generated by the exhibition, which I won't go into the entire history of because we could do a seminar on that alone. Uh, you can find that information easily. But it was that controversy that made me want to go see the exhibition. There were picket lines and demonstrations out front of the museum. I had been uh, very involved in social causes from the time I was a teenager. So I think I, I might have wanted to go get on the picket line, or at least see the picket line, at the very least. And as it turns out, on the day I got there, there were no demonstrations, there were no picket line. So I like to think that fate conspired for them to not be there, so I could go in and see the exhibition and do the thing that I needed to do. Uh, because who knows what would have happened otherwise. I don't know that I would have crossed the picket line, first off. Uh, so I went in, and that was the first time I had ever been in a museum on my own outside of the usual school field trips. And it was a very intimidating experience. I was 16 years old, never been into a museum. And for your first visit to a museum as a teenager to be the Met. <laughs> I came in and I was kind of overwhelmed. Had no idea where the exhibition was. Uh, was too young and intimidated to walk up to the information desk and say, excuse me, can you tell me where the hell I'm on my mind desk? I looked around and it appeared that people, people were walking around, they appeared to know where they were going. Yeah. So, so I thought that's what I would do. I would, I, I would walk around and act like I knew where I was going. Uh, keeping an eye out for the sign that said, hard on my mind. And that's what I did. I started walking around, uh, looking. At that time, the Egyptian hall was left at the entrance walked around, was fascinated by the mummies, uh, which began my interest uh, in Egyptian uh, art objects. Uh, and then eventually found the sign that said Harlem on my mind. Went upstairs, and it was for me a pivotal and transformative moment, uh, seeing these photographs of uh, primarily ordinary African-Americans on the wall of a museum and seeing people walking around looking at these photographs of African-Americans on the wall. I was looking at both. I was looking at the photograph and I was looking at people looking at the photograph because I'd never really been in a museum that way before. And the photograph that I most remembered 
from that experience uh, was a photograph by James Anderson. So, all of my mind uh, is the first piece. The second piece is the fact that my mother and father uh, had lived in Harlem. My mother and father actually met in Harlem. My father coming by way of Jamaica and New Jersey and then Harlem with his mother and my mother coming from Mississippi uh, to New York and Harlem. And they met in Sugar Hill at our St. John Baptist Church. Uh, and when I was born, we used to go back and make trips pretty regularly to visit friends and uh, family who still lived in Harlem. So I had a personal connection to the place uh, through my own history. So those two things, my personal connection to that community and the experience of seeing that exhibition led me when I got my first camera to, and thinking about what my subject matter might be, uh, this became my subject matter. And uh, I spent five years uh, in Harlem making these photographs. And as a direct uh, extension, uh, part of the controversy with Harlem on my mind, which was that there were photographs of African Americans that were being shown in a mainstream institution as was called downtown. This notion of images of people being made in a particular place and not being presented to that community as part of the construct of the audience, but that work is shown somewhere else. So I knew that when I finished this work, I wanted to exhibit those photographs in the community in which they had been made so that the people who were the subjects of the work would have access to the work and could also be part of the audience for the work. Uh, so I approached the Studio Museum in Harlem before I had finished the uh, project to ask if they would be interested in exhibiting the work, uh, which they were. And the show opened uh, in 1979. But this is the first successful photograph. And why would you, why, why, what spoke, well, what about it spoke to you, or what about it said to you? That it was uh, two things, because what I quickly found out <coughs> as I began making the work was that there was the picture making part of it, but there was also the very real negotiating of a social situation. How does one insert themselves into the social situation in order to make the photograph? And in this particular case, it's a Sunday morning in Harlem, and I'm walking down uh, 132nd Street, which was one of my favorite blocks. It became one of my favorite blocks. And I'm looking ahead, and I see this man, and he's in conversation with three older men. Mm -hmm. And I know that it's him I want to photograph. Mm -hmm. Not all of them, not all four of them, yeah. but him. Yeah. How do you do that? You know, I'm 20 years old or so. Four older men are having a conversation, yeah. and I need to say, excuse me, yeah. <laughs> um, I want to make a photograph of you. Not the three of you, yeah. but like, how do you do that? Uh, <clears throat> so, I approached this group of men and lost my nerve. I couldn't do it. I couldn't figure it out. How do you do that? They're talking. You come with a camera. They're not standing there waiting to be photographed. All of a sudden, the true complexity of what it would take, both social situation wise and picture making wise. <clears throat> so after that, I'm walking down the block having this conversation with myself because I now realize what this entails. You have to go back. You can't go back. You already said hello and good morning. What are they gonna what are they gonna think if you turn around and come back? But you have to go back, but you can't go back. They already saw you, but you have to go back. So I turned around, went back, and just made eye contact with this man and said, good morning, I just passed by again. I saw you a minute ago, and you look fabulous, and I'd like to make a photograph of you. And he said, oh, fine. What do you want me to do? And that was the second piece of it, the picture-making part. 
I figured out the social piece of it, not in the picture making part. What do I want him to do? Right. Yeah. yeah, you know, and uh, it dawned on me, but I wanted him to do what he had been doing before I interrupted you know, the situation. So I told him just relax, stand there. And uh, I was photographing with a 35 millimeter camera at the time, but very slowly and deliberately. Uh, because I had uh, seen Walker Evans's work. I'd seen a lot of photographs, the kinds of which I wanted to make, not knowing they were all made with a large camera on a tripod, which is why they look so deliberate. Uh, so I was photographing very slowly. I only made two exposures one, this one, and for good measure, a vertical one. Uh, but when I uh, developed the negative and made the first print and saw it. Uh, it was an important affirmation for me because this picture resonated for me as much as some of the photographs that I had been looking at. I wanted to make something that was equal to the photograph that I had been looking at. And this was the first time I was uh, able to do that, to make something that I felt as good about as I felt looking at Walker Evans' photograph or the disformer photograph. And I began to understand both the process and the kind of photograph that I wanted uh, to result from that process. So this is the first, the first important photograph for me. Yeah. You, you, also talk, you also talked about um, seeing the book The Movement. How, how did that, how did those kind of photographs also figure into the kind of photographer you wanted to be and the images that you wanted to make? Uh, which photograph? The, the book, The Movement. Yeah, well, the, the movement uh, is actually the foundation of the work uh, that became the Birmingham Project. Yeah. Yeah. Even though, interestingly enough, I obviously saw that book too before I began this this work some 10, 11 years later, but the, uh, the movement uh, figured most significantly in uh, the making of the Birmingham work, and that was 2012. Right. So, the, so you, in, the, in the catalog you have an essay that you said had never been published. What, what, was the, what was the original intention of that essay? What did you plan to do with it? Uh, it was to put down in writing my thoughts about uh, what I had wanted to achieve uh, in beginning this project, my motivations, and uh, what I thought this group of work meant to me and what I hoped it would mean to the larger conversation uh, of Harlem's visualization, uh, the visualization in photographic form of uh, black urban communities that have uh, a long history of being pictured through a lens of social pathology. I, I just wanted my writing to be uh, a clear statement and documentation of my intention. But I've written for a long time too, so I consider myself to be a writer uh, mm -hmm. as well. But it was important to put my thoughts down when I completed that project, you know, as a kind of uh, a final, you know, act of making and completing the work. And uh, it didn't even get used as the didactic for the exhibition at the time. So this is uh, the first time it's actually being published. Some, how many years later? 1979? <laughs> 40 something, 40 something odd years. So after The Man with the Bowler Hat, you went back and you kept going. And what, what kinds of things were you looking for and how did you continue creating these kind of relationships with the community and choosing your subjects? Well, Harlem has always been a place that I've returned to uh, and visited, even after I uh, completed this project. 
uh, certainly during the time I was still living uh, in New York. Uh, a good part of that, of course, had to do also with my relationship with the Studio Museum in Harlem. Because uh, in addition to that being the place where this group of photographs were shown in my first exhibition, uh, I also, uh, actually prior to that, uh, was teaching a photography class at the Studio Museum, uh, began to meet what I would call other people like myself. You know, I began to uh, form my uh, community. Uh, at the Studio Museum in Harlem. Uh, so Harlem's always been uh, an important place uh, to me, uh, even after I was no longer making uh, a formal project or a formal you know, group of pictures about it, uh, which I didn't start to do again until the recent uh, Harlem Redux photographs. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that you talk about you know, these institutions that have favored in your life and in the photographs, each of these images, like the barber shop or, or you know, the, the, the meat seller, the butcher, um, each of these images, they're also about a kind of institution, a kind of, it may be small, it may be that one place, but each of them is a picture of a kind of social situation that you've inserted these people into or shown them as part of. You know, I, you know, I just... Uh... I lived in Queens, New York at the time I was making these photographs. So I would uh, take the bus and the train, actually the bus and two trains, uh, into Harlem and uh, just started walking. Uh, initially, the time spent was time spent uh, not photographing but familiarizing myself with the community and allowing uh, people in the community to become familiar with my presence, spending a lot of time on certain blocks that I thought I might want to photograph on, uh, but just trying to uh, build a level of reciprocal familiarity, mm -hmm. you know, out of which I started just going into different semi-public spaces like barber shops, you know, barbecue joints, striking up a conversation, telling them what I'm doing, asking them if I could make a photograph. And in all of the businesses, one of the things that I always told the person that I would do was that I would come back and give them a print. Because I always felt that it was important, uh, if possible, to give something back to the people who were giving me their time and allowing me to make their photograph. But I was trying to photograph by photograph, uh, build uh, a project that gave a sense of the larger community, uh, Harlem, uh, as a whole, men, women, children, people who had small businesses there, you know, some of the photographs that made a tent revival meeting, just trying to uh, make something that uh, conveyed not, I, I was not trying to engage in this uh, binary of a positive image, but to make honest photographs of the community uh, it presented itself to me. Mm -hmm. And it was also based on my reading of other photographs that I had looked at. You know, I, I don't, th this photograph could be based on any number of photographs that I've looked at, you know, from Van der Zee to Walker Evans and any, it, it doesn't even necessarily look like 1975, it could be 1935, 1940, you know, and there, there was also a certain quality of timelessness mm -hmm. that I was interested in. I, I didn't want the photograph to only exist in a very fixed sense of history. I wanted a kind of timelessness that, you know, recognized both the past moment and the contemporary moment, you know, the way the two intersect, yeah.
So you were looking at uh, Van Der Zee, Walker Evans, Dis Farmer, um, and then also Dick Roth as well, right? Well, well, Dick Roth was really important. I don't know if we have the photograph in here. Yeah. There, there's a photograph by uh, Roy de Carava that you know and some of you may know. Uh, it's called The Graduate. Graduation, yes. Graduation. And it's a young woman uh, in her graduation gown. It's a gown. It's not even a dress. It's a gown. Uh, walking past this vacant lot and she's in the light walking into the darkness. Uh, and that photograph really made me uh, even more aware of a certain quality of light within the environment, which actually became uh, a good part of the subject of the work after this photograph. This is one of the last photographs that I made. Uh, in Harlem. And I think you can get a better sense. That picture is hanging right in here. Yeah, it's hanging right at the back there. Right at the back of the gallery. Uh, where, where, you can, where you can see the, uh, the effect of the quality of the light much better than the slide here. Uh, but this, this photograph is directly related to that photograph of Roy de Carava. There's another photograph of two boys playing in the shadow and the light. Uh, Roy made me uh, aware of the light, mm -hmm. you know, and how important an element that is and what that can bring to the narrative in addition to a certain resonant representation of the black subject, mm -hmm. you know, this light, the man coming up the subway steps into the light. You know, light is, uh, is an uh, as an evocative and in some ways symbolic mm -hmm. element mm -hmm. coming from the light to the darkness or from the darkness into the light, with everything that that implies metaphorically. When we were speaking on Monday, you also talked about your, your own career as a musician and how you have the, as a jazz musician, you have the skills and you just walk in and you improvise, but you have the skills. But it, it's also in your photographs, this kind of sense of it's, uh, it's about being balance. able to improvise. Mm -hmm. You know, you have a structure, which in photographs is the frame, or what I call the immovable rectangle. It's never going to change shape. It's always going to be that shape. Uh, and that's akin to the bars and music or the structure of a musical piece, 16 bars, 32 bar blues, there, there, there's a structure, there, there's a shape, and then the improvisation takes place inside of that space or shape. And, and there's a uh, typical example of that. Uh, these two boys, the rhythm of that photograph, the, the almost perfect rhythm of that photograph without possibly knowing what's going to happen, but you're just ready. You're, you're kind of ready for anything. You know, the light and the space with the shape and the space. And then I was just waiting for that necessary element to kind of elevate the situation. It began with the woman, and I probably made one exposure of just the woman by herself, but I knew that that it, it needed a kind of rhythmic balance. And those two boys, I looked and I saw them coming. And uh, I kind of stepped out of the way so that they could walk in front of me, not behind me. You kind of improvise, you know, you kind of know what to do. And you just do it in the moment that it's happening. Uh, but my training as a musician and playing jazz and improvisation and music, uh, I think gives me the comfort to go into any situation photographically. Uh, never know what's going to happen, but you don't worry about it, you just improvise. Yeah. You know, but uh, you understand the material well enough, you understand the craft well enough, and you're adept enough to respond as needed, and hopefully with some heart too.
<laughs> yeah, what I love about this one and so many of them is that there's so many, there are all these little details where there are these interactions, you know, the little boys in the space and the, the woman leaning behind me. There's so many moments here of different levels of interaction, interaction with us, with you, um, and you can just keep going in all of these images. Yeah, it just happens that quickly. Mm -hmm. The moment where the feet are in harmony, mm -hmm. the moment where they look yes. at each other, Shadows. the moment where the hands are swinging yeah. in unison, okay. and you just have to respond. You only get one, one chance at it. Yeah. So when did you, so you said you'd been visiting Harlem and then that never really stopped, but when did you decide that it was time to kind of revisit the project and make new photographs, this time in color and largely devoid of people? Well, by, by the time I have decided uh, to formally begin the Harlem Redux Project, I had moved out of New York uh, to Chicago, where I'm living now, uh, but still visiting Harlem periodically. And Harlem has undergone uh, several waves of gentrification. Uh, several waves uh, in its evolution, uh, which has been an ongoing one since it was settled by the Dutch in the 17th century. But more recently, uh, that gentrification, uh, this is probably what could be called the most extreme wave of gentrification that's transforming the community. And uh, visiting Harlem periodically, uh, I became acutely aware of that, uh, aware not only of the ways in which it was changing physically, the ways in which social demographics are changing, the way that the physical environment was changing in a way that disrupts what you might call space memory or spatial memory, where it starts to look so different, the connection to the past exists in the memory more so than in the present. And I, I decided I, I wanted and uh, maybe even more deeply needed to make some work about that. Uh, yeah, one of the newer ones, and you could, can you tell us about the one, maybe the one that Vera chose with him that Can you tell us a little bit about this image? Yeah, so I just, uh, I started going to Harlem uh, intentionally in 2014 to begin this work. Uh, not knowing what the form of the work was going to be, because uh, since the Harlem USA work, my work has been centered primarily on the human subject, uh, and even more specifically using the portrait uh, as a vehicle to talk about any number of different issues and communities. And I knew I didn't want to go to Harlem and do, I don't know, contemporary portraits of Harlem. I wanted to talk about the place that was changing around the people. Not so much the people themselves, but the way in which the place was physically changing, the way in which uh, pieces of history were being piece by piece lost. Uh, so it took me about a year to figure out the, the visual and conceptual language for this work because it's largely uh, within the tradition of what would probably be called, if you had to give it a genre name, urban landscape. Uh, and that's never really been my space, although I'm very uh, aware of that history. You know, uh, going back to Eugene Atjay and Bernice Abbott's photographs of changing New York. And there have been a number of projects uh, that have to do with the changing shape of some uh, urban center. And I, and I know that work well, but that was not my language or my vocabulary or my field of interest. Uh, 
And so I started, and this, this particular photograph is one of the ones I made that I think uh, most clearly exemplified in a single photograph. Uh, the experience of that community. So it's an early Sunday morning, and uh, I'm out and I see this boy, this young man sitting there. And he's sitting there, and, and it, it felt like it was where he always used to sit, except that the building that he used to sit at is gone, and the community is disappearing around him, and yet he's still sitting there, even at the place literally transformed around him. Uh, I don't know how many others we have. There's one before that. Now, this is another one because I wanted to, I, I wanted to use a formal language, a very, a very formal uh, visual language to talk about uh, the preponderance, for example, of construction material in Harlem and what that says about it ongoing physical change. It's constantly uh, and continually uh, under construction. But I didn't want to approach this project as a kind of uh, a comprehensive documentary project because that's not the kind of work that I make. Uh, so I approached it uh, as one photograph at a time, making work that uh, signified and alluded to the changes that were taking place in Harlem. Because uh, it's also not aftermath, you're not, it's not over. Yeah, I wanted to photograph it while it was happen, to happening, to insert myself into this change as it was taking place, mm -hmm. rather than photographing the new buildings that were springing up afterwards. Because the aftermath, uh, gentrification kind of looks the same after the fact. Uh, I, I was more interested in describing uh, what that change looks like physically as it's taking place in this uh, community. Mm -hmm. They're kind of streetscapes in a sense. They're portraits of streets rather than focusing on people. Uh, I myself wouldn't call it that, but I would accept that because it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I would accept that if someone were to say that. Uh, because uh, Someone, someone did say, well, you're still making portraits. It's just it's a portrait of the place and the community. Mm -hmm. That could be true, mm -hmm. but it's not, not necessarily <laughs> my okay. yeah, yeah, it's because I had, partially because I had uh, pointedly decided that I didn't want to make portraits in Harlem. And for all I know, it may very well be true that I am making a portrait of the place in transition. Uh, but it seemed kind of paradoxical to talk about these kinds of photographs you know, through the language of the poetry, uh, which is usually centered on the human subject. So, is it, was it the same kind of slow process of, of making these images as, a, as an earlier project, um, working very slowly? Well, there's, there's a clip. Some of these photographs are made uh, in the same locations, although there would be no way for the viewer to necessarily know that. I can't see the photograph from where I'm sitting, but there's a photograph of a man standing on a corner. <clears throat> it's the corner of 125th and Lennox, and behind him across the street is, uh, well, that whole block has been uh, demolished and the new Whole Foods building is opening uh, right in that location. And there's a photograph in the front that showed that building with the uh, word lost graffiti yes. on, on the construction sign, and that's actually the location of one of the early photographs. So there is uh, that kind of relationship also, so I don't know that it's necessarily uh, apparent to someone who doesn't know the community well. But that's kind of that's kind of interesting that it's not explicit. I mean, that's also another genre of photography, re-photography. You know, so you're kind of resisting that as well. Yeah. Let's let's probably take one one or two questions if, if the audience has it. Our, our time has passed by very quickly. Let's see. 
take one or two questions? Sure, go ahead. Um, so, um, you didn't really talk about, so I have two questions about what you were just talking about. The shift from black and white photography to color, and I don't know if the things you've been doing prior, in addition to your Harlem series, are in color. Um, so that may answer that question. But also there's something about, so I, you know, I love them all. Um, these are great in the sense that they do their portraits of spaces. But I kind of want to know like where the barber shop guy is and where the meat guy is and what happened to those people. And I'm not saying you should do what I want to do, but um, there's something so fascinating about what <laughs> happened with the spaces and the people. So, so it's over to Well, there is uh, in uh, most of the Harlem Redux uh, photographs, uh, an intentional absence of the human subjects in the community, which does also allude to a disappearing population within that community. Uh, so that's, I think, part of the answer to your question in terms of what happened to them. Uh, a lot of them are gone. Uh, partly because the photographs are 40 odd years old, so the older people are clearly gone for that set of reasons. But because of the profound demographic shifts that have taken place uh, in Harlem that are not yet, yes, yeah, not yet absolute, but uh, the trend is pretty clear. So there is a piece of Harlem's population that is disappearing, even as the population is changing. You know, which is to say that Harlem is not at the moment a depopulated community. That that's absolutely not true. But there is a certain piece of the community that is disappearing. And for me, this project is a kind of meditation on absence, loss memory. Uh, so they're, they're entirely subjective in, in that way. It's my own subjective meditation on my response to how Harlem's changing. Because I, I had a conversation with uh, a young artist, Jordan Castile, uh, who had been making uh, portraits of some of the residents of Harlem. Some of them are older men, some are younger. And uh, I've had some wonderful conversations with Jordan about that work because her paintings do in fact remind me that there are certain people who still are in Harlem. And perhaps if I was working on this project 20 years ago, I, I might be making that kind of work, and I actually did make the kind of work that she was making in the 80s, these portraits of people within a particular urban uh, environment. But as much as there are people still in Harlem, I'm most interested in talking about the way it's changing or what's being lost. Uh, there's a photograph of uh, looking through a construction wall, the cutout there, you know, this disappearance of the former Renaissance ballroom, you know, which was a hugely important place. Uh, I'm more interested in that uh, piece of the current narrative about that community. It's not the only piece, but that's my piece for now. My question is this. So if we fast forward Harlem from 1975 to you know, 2017, and instead of African Americans, is, is the immigrant community dealing with the current political situation? Will you, like a younger self, version of yourself, will do the same route? Or will you, like in a contemporary reality, take a different photographic approach? Which, you know, what kind of advice will you give on how to fight for social justice with a camera and to give a voice a to give a voice to a community in 2017. That's an interesting question because most of the work when I started this project, I was ranging pretty widely between 110th Street at uh, Central Park, 
on the southernmost end of uh, Harlem, all the way up to uh, Sugar Hill, uh, 155th Street. Uh, and I found that for what I wanted to talk about, it was most clearly exemplified within the space of Central Harlem. So I started working in a much uh, narrower space. With, uh, and now we're spaced in some of these photographs here, which I was ranging pretty widely. But the Harlem Redux photographs take place mainly in central Harlem, where the evidence of the most profound change uh, is taking place, and from which I know there's also plans for it to kind of begin to uh, spread out. Uh, I mean, already at the 110th Street, and uh, there's a new condo building that's just gone up, and uh, I forget the name of it, but the upper floor apartments, the most expensive apartments in that building go for $10 million, uh, which is obviously going to uh, seriously reshape the real estate profile in, in that community. Uh, but my, my focus has been mainly Central Harlem from river uh, to river because it provides the richest evidence of the thing that I'm interested in. You know, so I didn't necessarily set out uh, intentionally for it to be you know, this kind of deep, comprehensive. I, I was looking for situations that resonated in terms of uh, the things that I wanted to talk about through the way. Now, Harlem, of course, has been in a continual state of, you know, evolution uh, leading up to this moment. Uh, the moment I would say maybe it was 25, 30 years ago when uh, certain people started moving back into Harlem, like when Maya Angelou bought her place on Marcus Garvey Park. You know, there, there was a moment where certain people started to reclaim the community, and then there was a pause, and then Bill Clinton opened an office on 125th Street. You know, and, and there have been like five, you know, on average about five, ten year periods in between these different waves and significant moments that have now just completely accelerated uh, to the point, you know, there are all kinds of, uh, I don't even know if ironic tensions by the right word for it, because I think it goes beyond irony, uh, but uh, realtors who are now marketing apartments on Garvey Park by its original name, Mount Morris Park. Yeah. Who wants to buy a $10 million apartment in an area named after a black separatist who is advocating going back to Africa? Like, how valuable is that as a marketing device? You know, if you look up who Marcus Garvey is. Uh, so there's that level of it. And also, one of the things that drove me back to Harlem before I started this project, <clears throat> having been a drummer and come up in the community of both jazz uh, and traditional African drumming uh, in New York, uh, Marcus Garvey Park in Harlem and Prospect Park in Brooklyn were the center of the drumming community. You came together there on weekends, Saturday and Sunday, uh, in Garvey Park. Uh, was very close to the location of the Olatunji Drum Studio. Uh, I don't know if you guys know Olatunji, Drums of Passion, but Michael Olatunji was responsible for the introduction of traditional West African uh, drumming and music to New York, and then ultimately. So you have, uh, and he, that was the early 60s, so you have the location of uh, Olatunji Studio, 
which is now, it wasn't Applebee's, and I don't know what it is now, it's being further developed. Of course, that's gone. And when they started developing uh, on the perimeter of Garvey Park and putting up condos, and new neighbors started moving in, uh, they immediately started to complain about what one of them called on the local community block that damn jungle music. Didn't want to hear this jungle music. They came from someplace where it's quiet, they moved to Harlem, and now they're complaining about this jungle music. So you have all these kind of cultural tensions that are going on. That was, that was one moment that caught my recent attention and made me realize that I need to start paying closer attention to what's happening in Harlem now, which then went on to lead to this work. But there have been all kinds of social tensions, you know, that uh, have attended this, uh, this current wave of uh, population shifts that are taking place in Harlem. And I've been acutely aware of that. I've never, I've never not followed what's going on in Harlem, even after I left out of New York, because it's very, it's very central to who I am. If my folks hadn't met there, I wouldn't even be sitting here having this conversation. So it's that central, you know, to who I am. Thank and you I don't so know a long-winded way of yeah. answering <laughs> your question. We, we've, got to, we've got to end, but thank you so much. It was been a pleasure. Thank you all for joining. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr.